Hello, and welcome to Masterclass with Michael Eric Dyson. This discussion features an introspective look at race and reconciliation, where we will hear what the past has taught us about race and bigotry, as well as tools to move forward as a city and a nation. My name is Roger Milliner, Chief Growth Officer for Metro Plus Health Plan, choice for over half a million New Yorkers, and a subsidiary of the New York City Health and Hospital System, which is also the largest municipal health system in the United States. Metro Plus Health is more than a health plan. We offer a rewards program, telehealth services, a member portal, convenient options to make monthly premium payments, such as online bill payment features, and so much more. On behalf of Metro Plus Health Plan, our dynamic staff, and members, I want to welcome you to this amazing discussion, Masterclass with Michael Eric Dyson. Good day. Michael Eric Dyson here. What an honor it is to be here sharing with you my ideas in this masterclass about the issues of race and racial reconciliation and racial reckoning in our own time. Let's be clear. This is a time of extraordinary reckoning with so many forces, factors, fears, phobias, and possibilities that have been unleashed in our own day. In the 1990s, they talked about a syndemic, the convergence of at least two pandemics. On the one hand, we are dealing with the pandemic of a globally affecting virus, a virus that has now killed nearly half a million people in a grievous record here in America, millions around the world. And yet, at the same time, this particular pandemic has revealed pre-existing conditions and underlying inequalities that continue to mock the fairness and the justice of the delivery of health care in this nation. So on the one hand, we've got a global pandemic that has revealed the incredible fragility of the health of many African-American and Latinx, Latinx communities in our nation. Black and Latinx people in particular, Black and brown people in particular, are especially vulnerable to death as a result of COVID-19. The new coronavirus unleashed in 2019 with lethal ferocity and traumatic intensity has revealed to us that not all bodies are equally affected by this particular disease. When we look at black and brown people who suffer higher rates of heart trouble, of diabetes, of hypertension, uh, suggests to us that black bodies and brown bodies are more at risk. Some people will blithely and glibly suggest, well, why don't black people and brown people take better care of themselves? That the reason you are at higher risk is because you refuse to do the right things, eat the right things, go to the doctor and take care of yourself. But does, not, does that not reveal a systemic inequity that we claim we want to address? Does that not reveal a kind of radical indifference to the complicated and interlocking features and forces of our society that render black bodies and brown bodies vulnerable? For instance, if you live in a neighborhood with a food desert and you don't have access to whole foods and the neighborhood grocer, the ghetto grocer is one that stocks high sugar content cereals and mystery meat that are not the choices of cuts. By very process of elimination, food deserts that prevent you from going to better stores until they are way out in the suburbs or way away from you, therefore being stuck with the ghetto grocer if you can. And then the lack of infrastructure for transportation that could get you out to those places where there could be better foods and the lack of economic resources that allow you the monies to engage in the transportation that would permit you access to better quality food. Right there, you see that it is not merely an individual choice, but a result of systemic inequalities that are interlocking, that poor jobs, poor neighborhoods, 
and poor health seem to come together. Lack of transportation, lack of monies to get out to places where there are better uh, places to deliver food, where Whole Foods and other stores, Trader Joe's and the like, are not accessible to inner city people because of the food deserts and the gaping abyss between the have gots and the have nots. That is not an individual choice. That is a systemic inequity that needs to be addressed. On the other hand, when we think about healthcare and we think about the fact that, well, black people don't visit the doctor as routinely as they might, is this not because black people continue disproportionately to be prevented from flourishing in their individual health care, they not only continue to have problems with insurances, but the lack of access to high quality health care is equally representative of systemic inequities that prevent the flourishing of black people in terms of health and brown people in terms of health. If you use the emergency ward as health care maintenance, it means by the time you get to the emergency ward, because you lack insurance, and only in emergencies can you then therefore find relief and get taken to a, an emergency ward that allows you to see a doctor, but doesn't allow you access to routine physicals and checkups that would engage in preventive maintenance that prevent the flourishing of disease in your body and pathogens uh, racking your organs, and when you recognize that black people don't have that kind of routine access because of lack of health care, because of lack of access to doctors, because of lack of resources and jobs that would provide opportunities for that health care, then you see the interlocking systems of oppression working at the micro level of the health care system for poor people, largely in the inner city, but also in rural America as well. And so studies have been done as well. Even when we control for economy, even when we control for wealth, even when we control for wage, even when we control for class, that black and white people are accorded radically dissimilar and troublingly differential treatment by physicians in this country. Study after study has suggested that even black people and white people making the same amount of money enjoying the same kind of class experience in terms, uh, at least, of objective criteria, that they don't get the same kind of health care when they go visit the doctor. So a black and white person having a health, heart issue will not get the same intervention. The white person is routinely treated to far more aggressive intervention that has the potential to rescue them from serious troubles and traumas than a black person who, though having the same wage, the same wealth, the same money, the same class, is not accorded the same treatment. Beyond that, a recent study has suggested that black infants have a better chance of survival if they are treated by a black physician. Now, this doesn't mean White physicians are out there lurking around the corner suggesting we don't want to take care of those black babies. It doesn't mean that there's a conscious attempt of white physicians to undermine the positions of infants, to reinforce their precarity, and to suggest that they are not worthy of their medical knowledge or their intervention as a physician. But what it does suggest is that black babies who present particular problems may have better care in the hands of black doctors because those doctors identify with them. Those doctors empathize with them. This could be my child. This could be my infant. This could be my, my brother's uh, child, my sister's child. This could be my friend's child. And so there is a greater degree of extraordinary and powerful intervention necessary to be dealt with when it comes to the medical inequalities and apartheids that prevail. That we might be more curious about a particular problem that an infant has if we are black and that infant is black than if somebody else who looks at the problem thinks it has been uh, really unsolvable and moves forward. 
the level of curiosity, the level of empathy, the level of deep engagement uh, in a, a sense of understanding the requirements to help that child has to be addressed. So on the one hand, we have the global pandemic of a virus that has besieged the horizon of nations across this globe. On the other hand, we have a racial pandemic. And that racial pandemic has been revealed to us time and again through police brutality, through racial profiling, through retail profiling, through tracking our kids in school and assigning them to uh, lower stations academically, kicking our kids out of school earlier and earlier, seven and eight and nine and 10 years old. And then those kids get kicked out and get tracked into different quarters, different tracks, some on special education, others on problem children. Then they get sent to detention. Detention feeds them into jail. Jail becomes a warehouse for prison. So that the pipeline from schools to prisons is not merely a mythological projection of those who overreact to the over-policing of black and brown and indigenous kids. It is an actually existing, empirically verifiable trauma that these young people endure. So when we talk about systemic inequity, we talk about racial injustice at multiple levels. We saw the George Floyd protests and the degree to which they revealed pre-existing conditions of racial inequity. Had we not literally seen that movie before? Had we not seen Eric Garner get taken down in Staten Island? Here was a man who sold Lucy's, loose cigarettes on street corners, a minor offense. And on the day he was taken down, he was not even engaging in that minor activity that otherwise might have flagged him and put him on the radar of the cops. And yet several policemen took this man down and Officer Daniel Pantaleo put him in a chokehold, an illegal chokehold that despite his claim, what is it, 11 times, that I can't breathe, that Mr. Garner was ignored that his fundamental plea to breathe had been ignored. And here we are several years later, George Floyd, six foot seven, six foot six at least, black man, former bouncer, out of work because of COVID. He also had COVID for a while, taken down in the streets of Minneapolis. And on his legs and his torso and his neck, police people were leaning in in a lethal and destructive fashion. Officer, Former officer Derek Chauvin bore his knee into the neck of Mr. Floyd, into his already mortally depressed column Mr. Chauvin dug his knee on that fragile vertebrae. Mr. Chauvin, with callous disregard, with sadistic ignorance of his condition, his condition of not being able to breathe, his pleas, even to his mother, recently departed, begging her to intervene somehow, crying out to his mother in a way that touched millions of people around the globe that despite his plea and his call, he was mistreated, he was ignored, and finally and tragically, he was killed before our very eyes. Our eyes that were extended because of the recording of Ms. Darnella Frazier, a 17-year-old black girl who captured the horror, the trauma, and the tragedy on her cell phone and then uploaded it to Facebook and the world saw. 
And so my brothers and sisters, my friends, this racial catastrophe, this racial cataclysm, this extraordinary outbreak of racial consciousness in sharp juxtaposition to virulent anti-blackness, which undercuts and undermines civic polity in this nation, social policy in this nation, public policy in this nation that is geared toward the relief of the suffering of black people at the hands of the police. Police who enjoy qualified immunity so that they are not held to account because of the constitution that representatives of the state as police are cannot be individually held liable in the performance of their duties in a public demeanor. And then we know them working with state's attorneys general or with local prosecutors, those prosecutors who are responsible for holding these police people to account will not hold them to account. So because of qualified immunity, and because of the intimate web of relationship that is often toxic and ominous between law enforcement and the criminal justice system, we are in deep and profound trouble. And on that day, when Mr. Floyd was murdered, uh, something shifted, something snapped, and something changed. And as a result of that, flooding the streets were hundreds of thousands of American cities, citizens around the country, more than a million we know, who flooded the streets of America to bear witness to their outrage. Black and brown and red and yellow and white people, hundreds of thousands of white people saying we will not stay on the sidelines any longer. Why? Because in a sense, the asterisks had been removed. What is an asterisk in this case? An asterisk said, well, there must have been some problems. Maybe the black person was too indecent and too dangerous. No, he was lying prostrate on the ground. Maybe they were cursing the police out. Not that that should be a reason to legitimate and validate uh, the murder of an innocent black human being, but no cursing was going on against the police, just an exclamation of frustration and depression. Perhaps, and he called them officer and sir. Maybe he was dangerous. He was dangerous to no one because three police were arrayed on his body. And so many white brothers and sisters saw this and said, no more excuses, no more asterisks. And I think it hit differently this time because many of us were at home because of the pandemic. So we were used to seeing images flow across our screen. We were used to seeing these images float into our consciousness after claiming digital attention. And in this sense, because we were tied to our devices, Many millions of us, many more of us saw these images and were deeply and profoundly affected by them. And so they flooded the streets, millions of Americans, and not only Americans, but people around the globe. Finally, we said a racial reckoning must occur. Finally, we will not any longer tolerate systemic inequity. We will address systemic racism. But that was seven, eight months ago. Here we are now. And things have changed in the sense that no longer is there discourse and dialogue about systemic racism. No longer are there black boxes and squares being put and posted on social media to indicate our deep and profound empathy with those whose backs are against the wall, those whose bodies are crushed to the ground, those whose faces are being uh, pinned beneath a knee, those whose necks are beneath the knees of viciously indifferent and radically uncaring police people in America. And so they flooded the streets, willing to put their bodies at risk, 
And now there's been a shift, but I think this is the unsexy normal part of racial transformation and of racial reckoning. In many ways, many white brothers and sisters in the early part of this summer, in May, said, perhaps even in spring, that we will not tolerate this. They fell in love for the first time, many white brothers and sisters, with black people, many non-black people, fell in love with black people. No judgment, no hostility, just an observation. So they were in love. They were expressing through the romance of commitment to social justice and talking in terms of racial and uh, inequality and systemic inequities, speaking about the need for transforming our criminal justice system and having our corporations register the difference. But now here we are in the old lovers category. It is not that the romance was not real. It is that the expression is different. So now we are at a different stage of the expression of racial love by white brothers and sisters. The unsexy, normal, everyday part, where it's not about candies and chocolates and flowers and celebration and moonlight dances and dates. It is about the unsexy. Who's going to take the kids to school? Did you put the toilet paper in the right way? Are you rolling the toothpaste from the bottom and not the top? Did you leave the toilet seat up and therefore I almost drowned in it? Can you put the toilet seat back down? Who's going to take the kids uh, to gym practice or to practice their violins? Who's going to share in the responsibilities in the home? This is the unsexy normal that translate the romance of concern into everyday practices that uplift and solidify that love. And so it is true for racial reckoning as well. We could be discouraged and suggest nothing has changed, that we've gone back to normal. Perhaps we're working out in the unsexy every day, the terms of our engagement as human beings, whether black or white and other races, red, brown, and yellow, will continue to be the object of our inquiry, the subject of our empathy, and the basis for altering the logic of American democracy. So my brothers and sisters, this is the unsexy normal, the everyday, where we must make a renewed commitment to telling the truth, to doing the right thing, to making certain that we will elevate the concerns of those who are black and indigenous and people of color. But beyond that, we're also deeply committed to the prospect of transforming this culture by the everyday ordinary work of asking corporations, what are you doing? Not just in terms of a commitment when it's bright and in the sunshine of public acclaim, but who's in the room to make a decision about what ads will be cut, what people will be hired, what diversity and equity practices will be reinforced what determination to do better will look like, how we hire more people of color and women and other minorities. This is the unsexy normal and the everyday that tests the durability of our ideals and the nobility of our aspirations. But not only that, let's talk about the economic inequalities, the political problems we, we have, and the ways in which our families are affected. Let me start with the economy. Here we've had a downturn in the economy because of this COVID economy. And a COVID economy means that we have depended upon the government to distribute resources. And people who used to beat up on poor people, people who used to dog poor people, people who used to dog those on welfare, on SNAP, those on TAMF, th those who are receiving benefits from the state and from the government, now having to receive benefits from the state and the government, suggests, my brothers and sisters, that we need to be far more empathetic and understand that any downturn in the economy can affect us, that this is a metaphor and a symbol of how all of us given the crisis that prevails, can experience 
the deep and profound sudden crisis of economic immiseration that leaves us vulnerable, without jobs, some of us, without resources to take care of our family, some of us, without the ability to sustain ourselves and therefore dependent upon what we would six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, have denigrated and derided and chided poor people as somehow being on the dole, not wanting to work. When the truth is all of us want to work, most of us want to work, and yet many of us are prevented from working because of this COVID economy. Allow that to make you far more engaged, empathetic, sympathetic even, and understanding of how many peoples have been deprived of adequate resources in systemic fashion over hundreds of years, over a century. And we have neglected them, we have ignored them, we have stigmatized them, we have demonized them. And yet many of us are in the same position. And then when we look at broader changes in the economy, the constant shift from manufacturing to service industries, and those service industries drying up for all but those who have the retooling and retraining that is capable, that they are capable of receiving if they are blessed, if they are fortunate, and those who are retrained, therefore retool themselves for a service economy. The shift from manufacturing to service uh, industry hit my family hard when I was a young person growing up and my father refused to go on welfare, started his own grass cutting and siding business. But what resources, what options, what alternatives do people have? And so what we must understand is the degree, the degree to which we must constantly be empathetic to those who are certainly uh, in the process of trying to figure out how their lives will work, to figure out how their lives will be put together, to figure out how the resources and stresses to which they are subject, right? The resources that uh, disappear and the stresses that they are subject to can somehow be addressed in a fundamentally uh, powerful fashion that allows them to maintain their dignity, receive the rightful resources of a government whose checks derive from the tax base that they have contributed to. And so this economy, this COVID economy has been devastating, but especially for black and brown families already hard hit, even more hard hit, and the exacerbatory effect of a COVID economy on families that are already marginal, for whom the safety net has been shred, for whom public resources have dried up, and for whom individual private possibilities in the economy are virtually nil. Let's remember them. But let's also remember our families in relationship to that. Mothers and fathers who before the COVID economy had to stay away from home because they were working two and three jobs. They didn't have the wherewithal to be able to support their families without working two and three jobs. And some people called them poor parents because they didn't show up at the parent teacher conference. And the reason they couldn't show up is because they were working the second job or third job, or they weren't home and their kids were latchkey kids because again, they were out working, trying to provide for those children. And because of their marginal status economically, they couldn't afford the luxuries that others of us enjoy. And when black and brown families are poor, it's part of what sociologists call concentrated poverty. Their individual family is poor. Their neighborhood is poor. Their community is poor. Their schools are poor. They usually don't have access to high paying, high wage jobs. They don't have necessarily examples in communities of people who are upwardly mobile because the entire community is suffering from economic oppression. And as a result of that, the immiseration that the entire community faces is different qualitatively than some white communities where the entire community is not suffering and they have the ability to have outlets and examples and connections that offer them a way up and out that catalyzes their amelioration, that gives them an opportunity to have a better future. 
And so our families are under assault too. And black and brown families especially are suffering hard, are suffering a lot, are suffering a great deal of distress because of their vulnerable positions in these economies. And then when the COVID economy strikes, the little purchase they had on economic st stability is all but shaken, is all but shattered, is all but undermined. And they are left with barely, with the bare ability to sustain their families. And so think about that as we talk about this pandemic of racial intolerance and anti-blackness and racial inequity. And then politics, finally. We saw on January 6th of this year, a largely white crowd taking to the Capitol, angry that their man didn't win, believing that there was fraud and when there was none, believing that the election was not appropriate or proper or done correctly or conducted uh, legally, all of that is untrue. It was the proper, appropriate, and legal conduction of an election that led to a result they didn't like. And isn't it interesting, even paradoxical, that a black person like a Colin Kaepernick can bend his knee on a gridiron and be called un-American because he's protesting silently, gently, lovingly, respectfully for those who are deprived of resources, of those black people who are not seen as equal citizens, who are not seen as human beings, whose lives don't matter, for whom the police continually come for, that their lives are continually undermined by cops, that they are continually and routinely and habitually shot, tasered, or otherwise harmed, traumatized, and in many cases, killed or even murdered. And so these mostly white brothers and sisters go to the Capitol trying to undo a duly conducted election. And forces all over this country, 106 to 110 laws generated by at least 26 to 28 state legislators, legislatures that are trying to undermine the ability of American citizens to more easily vote, which you know means directed at black and brown peoples so that it will be extremely hard for them to vote because the outcome was not acceptable to those far right wing and conservative forces. And so they're trying to make it more difficult for black and brown people among many others to vote. This is the expression in subtle but powerful fashion of white supremacist logic. No, they're not lynching people. No, they're not calling people the N-word, but they are systematically preventing the flourishing of black and brown people politically, denying them the franchise through stratagems that seek to undermine their capacity to, to pull that lever or to register their conscience on a ballot. And we know that those white folk been black folk. We know had those people who stormed the Capitol been people of color, they would have been shot down, tasered. No police pictures and selfies would be taken with them. Instead, they would be treated like the scourge of the earth, as if they were not serious about the embrace of American democracy, as if they were not protesting against racial injustice that prevents them from enjoying the franchise, as I've just indicated, but they were be seen as un-American. And how ironic that white brothers and sisters who gathered on the Capitol, who deployed the Confederate flag, a flag of traitors, a flag of secessionists, the symbol and the remarkable uh, icon of those who hated this country so much they abandoned it, fought against it, and tried to undermine its integrity because they wanted the ability to own human beings as slaves. And now their legatees continue to hold up that bloodstained banner in the name of heritage, 
they say, and not hate. And yet that heritage has included hate of black people and others in this nation. And so my brothers and sisters, a syndemic, the convergence of two pandemics, of a global virus, of COVID-19, and a pandemic of racial inequity, of COVID-1619, in recognition of that time in Jamestown, up the road here, when what they said was 20 and some odd Negro slave, enslaved people arrived in Jamestown to begin the process of imprisoning against their will, entombing against their desire, enchaining against their volition, black people. And as Howard Thurman said, the rawhide whip of the overseers, the long rolls of cotton, were the manifestation of the desire of white people to subordinate us. And we became the technology of white self-definition, the technology that extended the instrumentality of their wealth building and creation and the physical geography of the nation built upon black labor. And so this endemic of COVID-19 and COVID-1619 is here. What we must continue to do is not only study and think and read, though we must do all that, but we must turn as white brothers and sisters to our own white neighborhoods and say to them in ways that they will never hear from anybody, not, out, not within their own environment, not within their own league, not in their own ethnic or racial group, to hear the truth about racial injustice, about white pride, about white bigotry, about white hatred, about white privilege, about white comfort, about white innocence. And when we can do that effectively, honestly, openly and directly, we will be on the road where we are living out the motto of this nation, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Thank you so very kindly. COVID has ravaged our communities from a health and economic standpoint in an unprecedented way. Job loss has made access to quality health care for those now unemployed a serious challenge. How can we meet the needs of our communities and amplify the critical role public health plays in New York City and across the country? An excellent question. There's no doubt that COVID-19, the coronavirus, uh, the novel coronavirus of 2019 has revealed gaping holes in the American economy, has shifted and shed resources, has shredded uh, existing infrastructures of jobs, and has rendered nearly obsolete certain skills that people possessed in order to make a living for themselves. Um, there's no question that our health care system has been viciously attacked uh, during COVID. Uh, many people who depended upon that healthcare system uh, no longer have that ability to depend upon that healthcare system. And those who have access uh, to high quality healthcare don't even have the same level of intervention because especially when it comes to a vaccine, for instance, uh, those vaccines are stratified in a tier of distribution that doesn't reach everybody at the same time. And that means, therefore, that the entire healthcare system has been shifted and that those who are used to getting high quality health care will in all likelihood continue to receive it, but in a graduated phase. And those who were already on the outside will continue to be rendered marginal as a result of their lack of access to health care systems. Now, certain interventions will suggest that the elderly, those above a certain age, and hopefully those in a certain uh, profession will get the, the, the vaccine first. But if you happen to be somebody who's working class and working poor and you're doing delivery of foods and services and in some instances, health care itself, then hopefully you will be relieved. But millions who do not fit those categories, who nevertheless suffer, will continue to do so. And so we've got to look again, rejigger the distribution of the vaccine 
uh, to enhance the health of those who are most vulnerable. And we know that black and brown people continue to be vulnerable. And we've got to also be sure to use our churches, our synagogues, our temples, our voluntary organizations as means to educate people about healthcare, to distribute masks so that even before they get the vaccine, they continue to socially distance and wear masks. And even after they get the back vaccine, they continue uh, to wear masks. So we've got to give them also a sense of the healthiness of the potential of this vaccine. Now, some of us who are allergic uh, to medicines and who may be in a higher at higher risk should certainly be careful. But one of the things we can do is to distribute information and knowledge that would tap down on some of the conspiratorial thinking that makes black people vulnerable. Now, black people don't have the QAnon uh, variety of conspiratorial thinking. What black people have instead is a solid history of racial abuse in the name of uh, scientific experimentation and healthcare management that has resulted in the destruction and death of black people. Need I mention uh, Tuskegee, but Tuskegee is but one point, one inflection point in many ways that black people have been experimented on. Shall I say Henrietta Lacks up in Baltimore, up in uh, Maryland, where her body was ravaged uh, for its resources, harvested and hosted so that she became the metaphoric extension of the medical exploitation of black bodies. But at the same time, we must say to black people is that let's be reasonable. But black people are not afraid of science. We're afraid of scientists. We're not afraid of medicine. We're afraid of doctors. So once that trust and faith and belief can be restored, then black people will be able to trust the doctors and the other medical professionals who only seek their best in the midst of this pandemic. And then finally, uh, what New York City can do is to continue to invest uh, in the delivery of resources for the most vulnerable. And when we talk about opening our schools and when we're talking about uh, kids being able to return to school, and then those parents who don't have jobs uh, may be able to help them out a little bit, but those who do have jobs won't be able to pay as much attention to them as necessary. And if they are out of work and the difficulties of providing for their families so that these young people are able to eat and without a sustenance uh, that is in their bodies, without an adequate regimen of uh, food per day, then it only exacerbates the pre-existing conditions of economic inequality that prevented the flourishing of these young people to begin with. If we can address those needs through our churches, our temples, our synagogues, and our other places of worship, our voluntary organizations, then we will be able to leverage our power, our influence, and our resources to help the most vulnerable. During Masterclass, you have touched on the historic reasons that our communities are slow to trust the handling of major moments such as the current pandemic. What do we need to do to get a level of common understanding in the near future? Do you see public health networks or other institutions in New York City and across the country supporting that work? Yes, it is extremely important to understand the skepticism, the sometimes outright hostility, and certainly the doubt, the healthy, doubt that black people have when it comes to the delivery of and distribution of medical and other resources in our communities. And when it comes to health care, more broadly, because of our righteous skepticism of the manipulation of black bodies by scientific enterprises that were not neutral about the distribution of resources or the experimentation on black and brown bodies. So when we acknowledge that, we can acknowledge the distrust uh, that has come about in our communities, a well-earned distrust. And so the current pandemic is revealing of the historic legacies of distrust that have historically hurt our communities 
because we have a righteous reason to be distrustful. The question is, what is New York City and the nation willing to do to curb that distrust? They can send out black people of note who will take the uh, who will take the vaccine. Maybe we can call it a black scene. <laughs> Maybe we can have some fun with that in our advertisements and suggest that well-known black people are taking the black scene, the vaccine, and as a result of that, are protecting themselves, hedging their bets against potential potential infection or uh, later on. And so we've got to acknowledge that. Um, and also, we've got to understand the degree to which uh, we began to educate people about the effect of medicine. We educate our institutions about the historic legacies of inequality, the Tuskegee experiments, the Harriet Lacks, and then we understand more empathetically why black people would be skeptical. And in educating themselves and being educated, then these figures, largely white, will understand why black people uh, don't want to involve themselves in vaccines, don't want to get jabbed in the arm. But we can combat that. We can combat it with knowledge. Kismikia um, is the young lady uh, who was working uh, or who is working with uh, Fauci in terms of developing uh, a vaccine. Here is a black woman, uh, Dr. Kizzy, as she is called, who has done tremendous and brilliant work in combating the ignorance, the conspiracy, and the outright malicious misinformation that is being spread in our communities. And ultimately, until we grapple with the fact that many white supremacist organizations would rather see nothing than the failure of black people to take these vaccines and to die off in ways that reflect the systemic destruction of black life. Until we acknowledge that and other stratagems and strategies and deliberate uh, means of misinformation and disinformation uh, with the attempt to hurt, harm, or sometimes withhold uh, precious information from black communities. We must overcome all of that, be active participants in our own health, become active participants in the drama of politics that helps distribute these resources, and to understand our skepticism and to overcome it by suggesting that in order to talk about Black Lives Matter, we have to be alive to speak those words. So in the ultimate sense, and in the final analysis, I think that as we control uh, the level of conspiracy in our communities and fight back against the disinformation and the anti-scientific attitudes that prevail, when we do that, then we will be able, be able to have a far healthier community and a more thriving black neighborhoods across this city and indeed across the country.